Most people here in the United States are not aware of it or haven't thought very carefully about it because it doesn't seem to matter uh, to us. We think this is a, a, a bit of a financial crisis and we think we'll see it elsewhere uh, as the Fed continues to raise interest rates as it seems uh, want to do. Certainly this week was full of speeches from all the Fed members uh, reminding everyone that they're going to take interest rates up until we get to 2% inflation. Kathy Wood believes markets are collapsing in what is turning into a financial crisis and things are only going to get worse before they get better. Kathy and her innovation-based investment strategy has not fared well over the course of 2022 with her flagship fund down close to 70% year to date. In her latest address to investors, Kathy explains why the Fed and their laser-like focus on battling inflation is going to cause more pain across the board, with financial systems already beginning to fracture overseas. Just this week, the United Kingdom's pension funds were on the brink of collapse with the Bank of England having to step in and reverse rate hikes before leverage collapsed the entire system. In an open letter to the Fed, Cathy explains why this could be just the beginning with more systems threatening to break if the Fed continues raising rates, which are now poised to go up 16-fold from last year. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Cathy points out why Bitcoin is faring so much better than the rest of the market and why it will always be darkest before the dawn. A new bull market will be born out of all of this chaos. Also, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance videos, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. M2 growth peaked uh, at 27% in 2020 and has been slowing ever since. It hit 4.1% in August. Uh, we believe it is closing in or might be below 3% on a year-over-year -year basis in September. Uh, which doesn't leave a lot of room for growth or inflation unless velocity is really picking up the, the rate at which money turns over. And we're in an environment where we do not believe velocity is picking up. If anything, um, I think individuals and businesses are becoming more concerned and uh, are spending less freely. If you look at M2 also, you'll see that it actually peaked in March. Now, this is very unusual to see sequential declines in money. Um, so it, we have not gotten back above that March peak, and uh, we may not get uh, back above it the way the ray, uh, that Fed policy is going. Um, and I think uh, I'd like to build the case a little more here that the Fed is probably making a mistake um, we, I say prob probably because I have to from a compliance point of view, but I really do believe the Fed is making a mistake. Uh, and uh, reflecting a little bit more on the Jackson Hole speech that, uh, that Chairman Powell gave in late August, we've come to recognize that uh, Chairman Powell really does think he is the reincarnation of Chairman Volcker, that we need him to take a sledgehammer to inflation, much like Volcker did. And, and history has treated Chairman Volcker very kindly. He did turn the tide on inflation. Now, what he did, though, was he turned a tide that had been building for 15 years. It started in 1964 with the Vietnam War and with the Great Society. So many social programs started at that time under President Johnson. And for 15 years, fiscal and monetary policy pretty much went rogue uh, as we look at history. Uh, even after shocks to the system, uh, like the oil embargo uh, the, and the stimulus that came about because of it, both monetary and fiscal policy, we never saw the kind of slowdown in monetary and fiscal policy that we're seeing right now. Uh, federal spending is still down 14% on a year-over-year -year basis. You never saw a decline in fiscal policy spending in the, in the 70s. Uh, monetary policy seemed to be on automatic pilot back then. Uh, the dollar was getting crushed toward the end uh, of the 70s, adding to the inflationary 
um, inflationary fire. And uh, so Chairman Volcker did choke off money supply uh, and, and killed inflation. It took a long time for uh, people to believe that inflation had peaked. In fact, I don't think um, many people believe it peaked as it did in 1981 until 1986 when oil prices crashed. Uh, so the inflation expectations and uh, uh, the inflation expectations were embedded in the system, and it was uh, very difficult. Uh, and, and Volcker did a masterful job. So that was over a 15-year period that inflation had built. Um, by the time the Fed got around to tackling it this time, it was not a 15-year problem. It was a 15-month problem. And from our point of view, it was caused primarily by shocks, major shocks to the system uh, that we had never seen before. We had not had, uh, since Spanish influenza, a global pandemic. pandemic. And uh, we had we did not have the supply chain problems, two years worth of them, uh, that we had because of the COVID panic. And then, of course, we had another shock to top those off, and that was Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So these are shocks to the system. Uh, this was not a period of embedding inflation expectations. And yet, Chairman Powell is taking a sledgehammer that is actually bigger, uh, much bigger. Uh, it's at least six times bigger right now and and could be eight to ten times bigger uh, if the Fed does raise uh, the Fed funds rate and ever, another 75 basis points on November 2nd. Markets are selling off across the board uh, and that's very unusual. It's uh, associated with crises. Uh, and uh, more convincing evidence to us that the Fed is too tight and that it will pivot. And when it does, it will do so, we think, significantly. Now, first, it might simply be rhetoric because they always like to tee us up for what the next moves are going to be. Um, and we haven't heard that rhetoric yet, despite all the evidence I just shared with you. Um, but that evidence I just shared with you tells us that the Fed is going to get the message loudly and clearly somehow. And it may not be showing through in the numbers they want to see, uh, but it will, it will. They are huge lagging indicators. They're basing policy on lagging indicators, uh, not what they're supposed to be doing. Anyway, if you take in the US alone, if you take equities and bonds and look at what's happened since the peak, you will see that the, the loss to investors is more than twice what we saw in 08, 09. That's how bad this is uh, because, uh, because bonds are selling off with stocks this time. Uh, so it's a, it's, and, and one of the reasons for that is um, a seizing up of liquidity. As I mentioned, if, uh, if people are facing margin calls or in financial difficulty, they're going to sell uh, their most liquid asset. They will have no choice, uh, especially with margin calls. Most liquid assets tend to be government bonds. And I think that's why we're seeing the backup in government bonds here, despite all of the deflationary signals in the pipeline. Interestingly, um, one price indicator associated with innovation is holding up, beginning to hold up, better than other prices, and that's Bitcoin. Uh, it's been interesting to see it flatline in the last month, uh, while others, uh, other indicators are reaching for new lows. Uh, now, this is not surprising in the late stages of a bear market. In our experience, innovation starts to outperform in the late stages of a bear market. Why does that happen? It happens because innovation is the new leadership. Innovation solves problems. Innovation solves the kinds of problems we have today, supply chain, uh, food, energy shortages, think the genomic revolution, electric vehicles, and so forth. Um, and so we believe that um, uh, innovation 
should outperform if we're toward the end of this uh, bear market. If the Fed's close to pivoting, even in its rhetoric, I think we are.